right. It is, uh, well, I'm going to put this up on New Year's Eve. Um, I'm not a person who has traditions in any way, shape, or form. I'm not very family-oriented, holiday-oriented. Um, I, I pretty much work every holiday to avoid, uh, you know, the, the fact that family doesn't talk to me really, um, and that I'm not sitting home alone. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but one of the traditions that I did have growing up, and it's pretty much been something that's been part of my life, my entire life, is the Twilight Zone Marathon. Um, I know I've probably spoken of the Twilight Zone many times on other channels or shows or whatever. It is, to me, the greatest scripted uh, anthology series that's ever existed. Um, culturally, socially, uh, it's, it's brilliant that it existed in the time in which it existed. Um, you know, Rod Serling was a genius. Um, you know, and, and you can look at it now as being, yeah, it started in 1959. You could look at it now as being dated and silly and, and maybe some of the, uh, outdated in a lot of its ideas. But at the time, you know, nobody was dealing with those kind of heady concepts of, uh, you know, of social and gender equality or inequality, um, in the way that Serling and Twilight Zone was, uh, you have to remember, you know, looking back at it, because I, 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 I very, very distinctly and clearly remember um, sleeping over my cousin um, Bobby and Ryan's house as a little, little kid, and um, the Twilight Zone being on TV, and it was the Invaders episode. It was the one... Um, with Vera Miles where she's mute and there's these little robots and it turns out in the end, spoiler alert, that uh, she's actually a giant on an, on an alien planet and the invaders were actually human astronauts. And I remember seeing that for the first time and it like blowing my fucking mind as a little, little kid. Um, and I, you know, from this point, you know, the, the, even if you don't know the episodes, you, you know the, you know, the Rod Serling's introduction to the Twilight Zone. You've seen it parodied uh, on The Simpsons or somewhere. Um, so it, in that regard, it's become watered down. But when you look at it in its unfiltered, purest form and the context in which it, it was created, it's, it's brilliant, you know? Um, you, we were the, these episodes exist in a time where the um, you know we're coming out of World War II. Uh, the scars of World War II still very much exist. You know you have uh, you know we're still f feeling these the repercussions of McCarthyism. Where you know America is entering into an age of um, of the the civil rights movement um, into you know women having more autonomy over their their bodies and. And, you know, and Serling was able to tap into a lot of these things and tell these stories through science fiction or through horror or through comedy in a way that um, if you told them in a more straightforward manner would probably tune out a lot of people. Um, but because you're able to do the, the brilliant thing that horror and science fiction is able to do, which is, uh, you know, tell very human stories with extraterrestrial concepts, you know, and, and that way it seeps into people's minds in a way that they didn't think it would. Um, or, you know, so, uh, I, I was thinking about, I was like, well, maybe I'll do a top 10 list. Uh, but no, I'm just going to talk about the idea of the Twilight Zone marathon and what it meant to me growing up. Um, you know, I, I one of my favorite things ever was so it used to air it, now it's airing on the sci-fi channel it used to air on channel 11 which was a new york channel that we would get in philadelphia and i would always have vhs tapes at the ready and just be recording them long play as long as i could um so that if i fell asleep on the couch 
um, the next day I could go back and see which ones I missed because I wanted to see every episode. And it wasn't actually until like a couple of years ago that an episode I'd never seen before, which was the encounter with uh, a young pre-Star Trek George Takai, um, where he plays a, a Japanese American um, and there's another guy who plays, you know, an American and, and the guy uh, finds a samurai sword in his attic when he's cleaning and Takai's character is, uh, you know, comes looking for work and the two of them, it becomes this, it's a bottle episode. It's two actors, one set. It's really the only one that I remember that's like that of any Twilight Zone episode. And it, it's this pressure cooker uh, type of episode where, um, you know, in the course of the conversation, more prejudices and 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 uh, connections are found, and, and it's it's really interesting. It works like a stage play in many ways. Um, you know, so I you know that one I didn't see until more recently, but I just I have these memories of the commercials that used to be on, uh, like you know, early to mid '90s New York television um, of like jewelry stores and. And, uh, and, you know, car rental plate or car dealerships, all this kind of stuff, um, or movie trailers that were movie ads that would play during that time. It was crazy to go back and watch those. Um, I got to find the tapes. I know I have them somewhere, um, of that era. And it almost, it is like, a, like the closest thing we have to time travel, you know? Um, but one of the cool things that, that whenever I think about the twilight zone is, um, one of my favorite, I, I have this weird fucking thing. I love, uh, one of my favorite, like, vibes is, is a light underwater. Like, if you ever go, like, on a dock at night and there's a light under there and it kind of casts light up, or, like, a swimming pool at night, like, something about that, I, I just fucking love that. And it's the same thing with a room that's only illuminated by the lights on a Christmas tree. And I'm not a Christmas person in any way, shape, or form, but I just have these warm fuzzies inside of me of, of, uh, you know, laying on the couch in front of the TV, uh, at my, at my parents' old house when I was in elementary school, middle school with just the Christmas tree light and just the TV. Um, and, and that's where I fell in love with the twilight zone. Um, and you know, being able to switch quickly back from like whatever nudie movies were on like Showtime or whatever or HBO. Um, you know, you hit the return button to the last channel and you're like, oh no, it's watching ESPN, you know, um, and not the Emmanuel series or, uh, you know, Hot Springs Hotel or, or, you know, the Red Shoe Diaries or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, so just laying and watching the Twilight Zone and, and these episodes and, you know, you have the, the ones that everybody knows and loves. Um, you know, the, you know, the gremlin on the wing of the plane and, and, uh, Bill Moomy is a little boy who can wish you into the cornfield and all that shit. But like these, you know, the, the twist endings and the, the actors who would go on to have huge careers, like a young Robert Redford as death, basically in one of the episodes or, um, you know, uh, an episode directed by Ida Lapita, an episode directed by a woman, you know, um, the, just a lot of these concepts and and performances and you go wow like you know now we have black mirror um which kind of does a lot of the same thing uh so that's why i didn't really get the jordan peele reboot of the twilight zone because black mirror is already doing it better than you know cbs would be able to do it and not to say like i was a fan of the 80s twilight zone reboot um it has one of the most frightening opening title sequences of anything uh ever it's just eerie and unsettling and it had some great episodes as well the one that Forrest Whitaker hosted didn't really do anything for me but then again I also really liked Serling's um night galleries you know Spielberg got his start there but you know just there, there were these episodes that, and and images that just stuck with me uh throughout my entire life and that's why I believe it's the, the you know again the, the greatest scripted tv that's ever existed uh every episode was its own new world every episode uh be it horror or sci-fi was was doing something interesting even the ones where like the cost cutting measures where they shot on video and it just doesn't feel right um but sometimes that even works to its advantage because there you have the episode with um the telephone calls coming from the grandmother 
you know, which is very poltergeist. Uh, there's actually, so poltergeist is essentially, um, you know, uh, the little girl lost episode and the, uh, the one with, uh, Bill movie getting the calls from the grandmother. Um, but because that one was shot on video, it's got this weird, an eerie, uh, eerie vibe to it. Same thing with the one, um, which was definitely a precursor to, uh, the final destination movies, which is the woman who keeps having, who she's a, she's a go-go dancer. She has a, uh, you know, she has a breakdown, winds up in the hospital keeps having these dreams about room 22 and this creepy woman saying room for one more, honey. And that woman went on to be on Star Trek and, and on the monkeys and stuff like that. Um, and just very like beautiful, exotic kind of look to her very stern, um, kind of vibe that you can only get from like women in the 1960s, uh, with that, 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 you know, that look to her. Um, and then at the end you have the twist where it was actually a premonition that the plane was going to explode. So she screams and runs away off the plane because the woman outside of the morgue was the flight attendant. Um, you know, you have that one, you have the, the, the family that go to Mardi Gras to the, the father is dying and, um, they have to all wear masks. And at the end they got his money when he dies, but now their faces are forever what their mask was. Um, you know. You have Shatner in another one, uh, and the idea of superstitions where, you know, they, the little devil on the table, they feed the money to it, gives him a, uh, you know, a, a little fortune and, and he s slowly believes it or, you know, um, the ones that are more, you know, prevalent and, and, and culturally conscious now than ever, like, uh, monsters do on Maple Street where, you know, how quickly people turn on each other. And you can look at it as McCarthyism. You can look at it as the Salem witch trials. But it's, you know, modern media is the exact same fucking thing of people who it doesn't take much more than lights turning on and off or, or you know, uh, mob mentality to turn people against each other. And in the end, it was, you know, aliens going, uh, aliens which could represent political, you know, powers or corporate powers going, it doesn't take much to get these motherfuckers to turn on each other, you know, and, and, it's amazing how many episodes from 1959 to five seasons, I think, up until like the early 60s still have punch today. Um, you know, you have ones that like predate, uh, predate um, the, uh, the Sixth Sense where the woman is being pursued by this hitchhiker the entire time. And you think that somebody that she hit who's following her, sort of like Creepshow 2, thanks to the ride lady, or like Carnival of Souls uh, twist, uh, where at the end it turns out that he's death and he's following her to be like, no, it's time to go. You died in this accident. Um, or like, you know, you have the bus that, uh, stops and, uh, you know, you, you, you're trying to figure out who the alien is. And at the end, it turns out that there are two different alien groups that they're at the diner and they both have the exact same plan where like, no, we're here to scout, you know, because we're going to take this planet and the Martians and the Venus or whatever, they both had the same idea. It's like stuff like that is just really, really cool. Um, another one of my favorites is, uh, uh, the, um, the mannequins, um, the woman, uh, who goes to the 13th floor of the department store. And at the end it turns and she's being pursued by these mannequins. And at the end it turns out that she actually was a mannequin and that they're all allowed to rum <laughs> mannequin rumspringer where they're allowed to like leave for like a week and then they have to come back. Like stuff like that is just really, really cool and, and, and fun and different uh, uh, the one, I, one of my absolute favorites, one people don't talk about a lot, which is, um, the clown, the ballerina, the general, you know, they're all these weird figures and they're all in this cylindrical room and they're trying to figure out how they got there and why they're there. And they you hear things above and the, the clown believes that they're in hell. And at the end, it turns out that they're all dolls inside a Salvation Army, uh, bucket. It's like things like that are just really fucking weird or Roddy McDowell winding up becoming a human in an alien zoo, uh, or like to serve man with, with Richard Keel. Um, you know, there, there are so many ideas in these shows and, and powerful moments that still to this day, I'll, I'll, I'll think about with great reverence. And I just remember watching these episodes for the first time and falling in love with them while, you know, watching many a Twilight Zone marathon. Uh, you know, my friends and I in elementary school used to talk about them and, um, you know, or the night call where the, the woman's getting these calls in the middle of the night and it turns out that it's, uh, 
it's uh, her. She's in a she's in a wheelchair, and in the middle of the night, she's getting these calls, and um, she's haunted. And in the end, it turns out to be the, the telephone line down the grave of the man who put her in the wheelchair, and he's trying to apologize to her. Like shit like that is like really cool, and you can see where a lot of these ideas, uh, where they would come from, um, you know, the short story format of it feels like very short story, very you know put these people in a situation and then resolve it with a crazy twist or something like that. And it's been done before and it's been done after, but I feel like it was done in such a perfect way with the twilight zone and the, the idea of the, the black and white and seeing some of these actors who pop up in it. Uh, Carol Burnett was in one and um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I genuinely, it's one of my favorite TV shows of all time. I, I love and, and I just, again, like, I just feel like I'm, I miss a time that doesn't exist anymore. Because I can watch them now, and I know them, and I almost know some of them line for line. I've, I've, you know, it, it's hard to do a twist while you're writing or watching something without automatically thinking of The Twilight Zone. Um, but, you know, it just reminds me of a place that no longer exists in a time where, you know, even when you were seeing it for the first time, but experiencing it again, you know, it brings you back to that first time. And that that's really cool. And it was always something I looked forward to after Christmas as a kid um, was just, you know, those, those stacks of VHS tapes, taping all the Twilight Zone episodes and or like falling asleep and then waking up and being in the middle of an episode. I, I remember one um, with Burgess Meredith and not the one that everybody thinks of with Burgess Meredith with you know, time enough at last, uh, where Burgess Meredith is, um, I think it's Henry Bemis or something where aliens give him like strength. He's this little timid man, but I just remember waking up and they were talking about, uh, these guys are arguing in a bar about Robin Roberts who played for the Philadelphia Phillies. And I'm from Philly and hearing them talk about the Phillies and this thing and waking up and like snapping to attention be like, Oh, I've never seen this episode before. Um, you know, and just little things like that, that are just burned into my memory. These little core memories of, of, uh, you know, or, or when they moved the Twilight Zone Marathon to the Sci-Fi Channel originally, um, the it was around the time that the movie Species came out. So every other ad was for Species, and there was a commercial for it signing up for the Sci-Fi Channel that used footage from Carnival of Souls, where uh, uh, Candace Hillgrass's character goes onto the bus and all the ghouls are on there, and they all stand up. So I just remember that so clearly. Uh yeah, man. I, 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 again, is, I, I'm not saying anything groundbreaking here when it comes to my love for this show. It's I, I don't think anybody in any, you know, uh, who has any affinity for horror, sci-fi, uh, pulp storytelling, anthology storytelling wouldn't already talk to about how brilliant this show was. Um, but just, you know, it was just one of my things, one of my memories that I wanted to discuss was just uh, those Twilight Zone marathons. Every year I looked forward to it. Every year I looked forward to taping those episodes and making sure that I saw each one, um, you know, and, and again, like seeing actors who would pop up on Batman or the monkeys. Uh, uh, Julie Newmar plays the devil in one of them. And again, she's one of the most, uh, like I was saying about women who look of their time, like one of the most beautiful women who's ever existed ever in the history of ever. Um, you know, she plays the devil in one of them. Then she went on to be in the monkeys and then she was on, uh, you know, and then she was also on, uh, you know, Batman, obviously, as Catwoman in season one. Um, it was just cool to see these people who were kind of stock players at this point who would pop in. And then you watch the very first episode of The Twilight Zone where, um, you know, they didn't have Serling doing the narration. There was a different person, but because of his schedule, he couldn't come back. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that's with... Um, uh, oh, God, from Bewitched... Uh, uh, I can't think of her name right now, but she's in that episode or uh, episodes like um, where the, the, uh, you know, the Simpsons did it uh, where, you know, the, there's uh, the crash land on a planet and there's the little people and the guy believes he's a God and, you know, he, he, he's inflating his ego through that or the one where the, they crash land on a planet and at the end uh, they find out that they never actually left earth, that he killed everyone else in his crew and when he crossed the desert, uh, and came over the hill, he found out he was just outside of Las Vegas. Like, shit like that is just like, whoa, what the fuck? Like, I imagine, like, nineteen early 1960s audiences on 
regular television being like, whoa, you know? Um, yeah, man, I, 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 have, I have great, great memories of the Twilight Zone marathons. And it was my, you know, and to this day, whenever I think about, you know, Talkie Tina with uh, Telly Savalas in that episode, or, uh, you know, the, the one where at the end, the ventriloquist and the dummy switch spots, you know, uh, you know, um, or the one where the, the airplane goes back in time and there's the stop motion dinosaurs and shit, uh, just awesome, awesome stuff. Awesome. And some of them were legitimately frightening too, you know, um, and not even the predominantly horror ones. You have like the obsolete man, which is shot in such a unique Kafka-esque style, you know, or, or, uh, uh, Eye of the Beholder where, um, you know, it, it shot like noir and, and it also poses extremely interesting ideas of, you know, obviously beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but to not see any of their faces till the end and to, especially at that point in, in network television where things were very blunt and, and to, for this one to be so shadowy and interesting, um, you know, it's, you have to you have to admire you know what Serling was able to do because I know from you know that they couldn't get sponsors uh, other than Chesterfield that's why Serling is smoking in every episode um, that the show would go from 30 minutes to an hour when another show got canceled they tried to cancel the, the Twilight Zone but something else failed so they had to stick it back in there for an hour um, and then uh, back to 30 minutes for its season fours and five um, you know, you have, uh, ones like, uh, in the first season, uh, one for the angels with, uh, the guy who was, um, the animated voice for, uh, the Mad Hatter and Alice in Wonderland, um, as like a, a street salesman, uh, or the one with, um, you know, uh, Night of the Meek with Santa Claus, uh, you know, just so many great episodes that didn't all have to be particularly horror or, or anything, but they still had punch to them and you still remember them or even if you only remember the twist or a performance there's so many random lines that i remember from from episodes that just ring true you know that just always stuck in this in the gray matter and not just because they were parodied by the simpsons or futurama or you know whatever or the greatest pinball machine ever made the the twilight zone pinball machine fucking great uh yeah i i i don't know i i i get really happy when I think about it, because it is one of those things, um, you know, in, in the greatest anthology series ever. And I'm a huge anthology fan, be it, you know, The Outer Limits or Monsters or, or Freddy's Nightmares to a lesser degree, T a Tales from the Crypt, obviously, stuff like that. Um, you know, I just, I love unique storytelling. Um, and I think while certainly wasn't the first one to do it, you know, I could, you could even trace it back before... Uh, you know, uh, RKO's, uh, the Mercury Theater, like when um, Orson Welles was doing, um, you know, was doing that type of storytelling. Uh, it, it feels like a continuation of um, morality tales from something like EC Comics. Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it all, one thing leads to another, leads to another. And, um, and in my forming, my love for these kind of things, the Twilight Zone is such a cultural cornerstone for me and and like i said just laying there in the in with the light of the christmas tree and and experiencing these stories for the first time or uh you know for the the hundredth time um they always were exciting to me and fun to me and and something that i hope other people grew up with as well and um were able to you know enjoy them the way that i enjoyed them um you know we live in an era now where you know, people know it just from the parody or they, they it's, you know, that's old fashioned or whatever. Um, but, you know, if you look a little bit deeper and you strip away the, the, you know, all the noise from it to what it, what it represented at the time it represented and what reverberated from it, you get a little bit more of an understanding and an appreciation for the Twilight Zone. So yeah, that's it. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just rambling at this point, like I usually do in these videos, but, uh, I, I saw a lot of people posting on Twitter and social media about being excited that the Twilight Zone Marathon was kicking back up on the sci-fi channel. And I'm excited that people still get excited about anything anymore. <laughs> All right. Uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful, safe new year. 
And uh, I guess I will see you all in 2024.